Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kristen Gicek, Vice President of the Center for Automotive Research, and I want to welcome you to our coronavirus update. Uh, we have a little bit of uh, data we'd like to show you, and then uh, we're going to get into a discussion with our guests. Uh, today, um, and uh, some of that will be questions that we have preloaded, but some of those can be questions from the audience as well. You have a chat window. Um, if you send a chat to uh, the organizers and panelists, or even to everyone, if you want your question widely known, uh, we will grab those questions and integrate them into the conversation that we're having here. So please use your chat window for questions. Um, and if you need to get in touch with us during the webinar, uh, organizers and panelists in the drop down is how you get in touch with us. So, with that, I'm going to kick this off. Uh, you know, coronavirus has been um, on a lot of people's minds for a few months here now, and certainly um, there's evidence of it everywhere we go, including the local Costco. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background today on, uh, let me get to my window here. Uh, background on uh, what's going on with China trend and market China trade and market trends overall. Uh, we'll look at the coronavirus timeline, uh, likely disruptions that we may see here in North America. Then I will introduce our guest speakers, and we'll go into the the Q and A section. There's a few takeaways we hope you get from this uh, from this webinar. One is a view of what the Chinese auto industry is looking like right now in the moment on the ground. Uh, an overview of some of the sourcing trends in China and some diversification strategies uh, that we've been seeing automakers and suppliers making even prior to the outbreak. Um, some insights into how this slowing China market, the uh, layer of US-China trade relations, and now coronavirus on top of that are all impacting uh, the US-China automotive industry. And uh, we're going to look a little bit at tooling and how tooling sourced from China um, will create some impacts here in North America and perhaps impact launches and product. Um, and then try to evaluate the potential for North American production disruptions um, and the financial impacts of the coronavirus outbreak, which may live long past uh, the uh, illness outbreak itself. Um, so. As I mentioned, you know, China sales have been slowing the last two years. The China um, passenger vehicle market has contracted. Um, this is a uh, has been a very rapidly growing market in the world. Um, is now the number one largest vehicle market in the world. Um, its slowdown is impacting a lot of other uh, markets as well, and um, impacting the suppliers that exist in China not only for the Chinese market, but for export uh, to other global production locations. So uh, a pretty steep slowdown in 2008 and 2009, given the rate of increase and the persistence of that growth um, over time. We've also seen labor costs rising faster in China than they have been in Mexico. This chart is comparing hourly manufacturing labor costs uh, for the for four-year period leading up to 2019. And you can see the China all-in uh, manufacturing labor costs um, have grown uh, just about $6.50 an hour, whereas it's still below $5 an hour in Mexico. Um, Mexico has had growth, but a, a much lower rate of growth um, than we've seen in China. And that's you know one of the factors that's influencing uh, sourcing decisions and uh, supply chain uh, alignment in China. The U.S.-China vehicle imports and exports um, have been uh, slowing a bit uh, in the recent years, uh, perhaps due to uh, the uh, back and forth tit for tat on, on tariffs and, and that impact. Um, you know, we export vehicles to China. The largest exporters from the U.S. are BMW, Daimler, Ford, and Tesla. Um, BMW and Tesla are locating, lo localizing more of their production in, in China. Um, Ford is uh, also producing in China um, for the Chinese market. And you know many of the vehicles that Ford exports are some of their more iconic vehicles like the Ford Mustang um, that they don't produce um, in other global source, in other global locations. Um, imports, we've seen a, an increase in imports. Uh, from 
the U.S. to China, uh, or I'm sorry, from China to the U.S. Um, largely, this is uh, General Motors importing uh, Buicks, and then Volvo or Geely Volvo uh, bringing vehicles to the U.S. market. Um, that has slowed down a bit too with the tariffs that have been layered on to vehicles. Um, on the part side, um, 2019 was a, a, a decrease in both imports and exports of, par of automotive parts uh, between the U.S. and China. Um, so our exports are much lower, obviously, than our imports of parts, um, but both fell uh, fairly sharply um, in 2019 over 2018. Um, about a quarter of the vehicle parts imports that come to the United States are destined for the shelves of your local Napa Auto Parts. Um, they're aftermarket, you know, lighting, fil air filters, spark plugs, um, you know, replacement motors, and things like that. Um, so about a quarter of the of the volume, the dollar volume of parts imports is, is going straight to aftermarket, and three quarters of it going to the production. Um, to the production base here in North America and in the US. Um, our friends at the Peterson Institute for International Trade um, have, a, have been tracking the US-China trade war. Um, this uh, slide, which you'll get after um, the event, um, has a link to their page where they track this, um, showing the ratcheting up of tariffs um, in the various tranches and what's affected. Um, and we did see, you know, a, a pullback a bit um, in once the phase one deal went into into effect. Um, but, you know, a, a real um, escalation on the U.S. side and the China side of putting tariffs on, on all sorts of parts, not just automotive parts. Um, we uh, are going to have an event on Tuesday. If you're an affiliate of the uh, Center for Automotive Research or an Automotive Communities Partnership member. Um, we have Chad Bound from the Peterson Institute um, who will be participating in our regular monthly uh, webinar that we do for ACP members. Um, and so Chad will uh, dig more deeply into the trade impacts. He's not an automotive expert, he's a trade expert. So we'll, we'll spend some time talking about trade as it impacts the auto industry uh, on Tuesday. So if you're one of our members, you can certainly join that uh, that webinar on Tuesday. At Center for Automotive Research, though, we've been looking at what are the impacts of all of these tariffs. So each one of these dots on the chart represents a different uh, trade code for either automotives or parts. So the car and truck uh, dots are red, the auto parts dots are blue. And you would think that if um, the tariffs were decreasing uh, imports from China, we would see more dots on the left side of that median, and we do. Um, and you would also think that if the rest of the world were picking up some of what China was no longer sending to the US, you would see things in that upper quadrant. Um, so an increase in change in imports from the rest of the world is the top half of the chart. A decrease in imports from China is the left half of the chart. And we do see a big migration from uh, imports from China from 2018 to 2019 that we're getting more of that, what we used to get from China now from other global sources. So a real move up into that top left quadrant uh, for automotive trade. I've gotten a lot of questions recently about what do we get from China? Um, you know, some of the media questions early on into the coronavirus crisis were, well, what do we get from China and how much of it do we get? And I said, it doesn't really matter if we get anything from China because we get things from every other country in the world and they get things from China. I mean, this is a very layered and intricate supply chain. But China's direct exports of automotive parts to the rest of the world, um, you know, so these are some of the more impacted, uh, the, well, these are the main categories. These are all the categories that com comprises 100% of China trade. These are big, broad categories like wheels and brakes and body parts. Um, that abbreviation NESOI or NESOI is the not elsewhere specified or indicated. That's the miscellaneous category. Um, but you can see, you know, the biggest impacts are um, in those top three categories uh, that comprise um, more than 50% of the trade. 
then what does the U.S. import from the rest of the world? Because certainly as we see the coronavirus impacting Europe, um, the Middle East, moving into Africa now, and certainly um, in other countries in North America, what do we bring in to the U.S. to make vehicles? Uh, our number one uh, import is vehicle body parts, then that miscellaneous category, then electrical and wiring and tires, and then engines and transmissions. Um, so these are the, the categories of imports that could be impacted um, if we see a slowdown in just global trade overall from all of our trading partners. Uh, the categories on this chart uh, represent about 77% um, of all uh, motor vehicle parts imports um, in, um, and about 115 billion US dollars. I'm gonna go over a quick uh, timeline and key developments um, on the evolution of the coronavirus. So first, um, the first reported case was in January, January 20th. Um, there were uh, evidence that the outbreak started in December. Um, we saw Wuhan City closed January 23rd and Hubei province uh, imposing travel restrictions just the day after that. Um, by the end of January, first half of February, there were travel restrictions uh, more broadly imposed across uh, all of China. Um, auto production, we started to see um, some disruption fairly fairly early on. Um, the, uh, th this coincided with the celebration of the Lunar New Year in China, where many uh, people in China were traveling. Um, but also, you know, there were a couple of other things uh, that our guests may talk more about. Um, many uh, companies that were looking to get their orders in before the ratcheting up of tariffs in advance of the phase one deal placed a lot of orders in the fourth quarter of 2019. So there was a lot of work on that. And then um, in advance of the Lunar New Year shutdown, the factories were working all out to get that work out and on the water on its way to its destination uh, before that planned shutdown week. Um, the crisis did delay the return to work until February 3rd, and then we saw it delayed further to February 9th. Um, we saw some partial production return um, in mid-February. Uh, then we started to see those impacts in the closer located markets, so South Korea and Japan um, in mid-February. Their supply chains are not as long as ours. Their shipment um, can get there in a, in a week or two. Um, they don't carry as much inventory as a result of not having that long delay on the water. So they were the first to be impacted outside of China. Um, and then we got government's um, uh, unofficial guidance for a March 10th uh, production restart, but we are seeing you know, delays in that even from local and regional governments that are um, imposing when manufacturing can restart. Um, the supply chain disruptions have happened simultaneously. We saw some at Hyundai Kia, um, GM here in North America. We learned through the UAW that there were some small wiring harnesses and decals and appliques that were going to impact truck production. Um, Honda in Japan was uh, were working around uh, disruptions in brakes and interior trim. Um, Wuhan City uh, makes a lot of things, <laughs> including turbos and instrument panels, brakes, um, and EPS and seat frames uh, in Hubei, uh, we see you know more brakes and HVAC steering, exhaust manifolds, power electronics. I mean th that is really a big center of um, automotive parts activity in in, uh, in China. So you know there there's a very wide swath of parts that are impacted um, by that shutdown that that remains in the center of the outbreak in in Hubei. Um, in North America, we're, we've seen uh, news that there's greater um, uh, priority shipping or air shipping parts. Um, GM has announced that they are doing that, but the, um, the airports here in, uh, in Michigan are seeing an increase in cargo traffic. Um, and then there's been some limited uh, guidance about uh, potential March impacts and at the EV day this week. Um, Mary Barra said that uh, GM should be okay through mid-March and then we're not really sure. Um, but as the virus spreads, we're going to see greater disruptions of parts supplied from other parts of the world. Um, you know, when we look at um, 
this disruption, and certainly this is an industry that's had many disruptions. We had the earthquake and tsunami in 2011. You know, there's often a supplier fire or you know natural disaster that that takes something out, and um, there's been virus transmissions um, around uh, regionally and um, not quite as fast spreading as this one. But uh, you know, the SARS M impact versus the coronavirus, and we you know would like to quote uh, the Morgan Stanley chief economist. Here are the former co chief economist. History rhymes, but it doesn't repeat itself. Um, there's a lot different about the coronavirus versus SARS in terms of the position of the uh, the, uh, the automotive industry here in North America. First, SARS was um, big, but fairly short-lived. Um, impact on the Chinese economy was about 1.7 trillion GDP um, and about 800 deaths in about 17 countries. Um, we're well spread beyond the 17 countries now uh, with the coronavirus. Um, the volume impact was about uh, just under 3 uh, million units of vehicle production, and it was largely concentrated in the first half of 2003, but there was a strong rebound in the ha second half that made up for much of that. Um, in 2003, China was the sixth largest economy in the world, um, a pair comparatively closed automotive market, and most of that impact was very local. In contrast, the coronavirus is growing in its impact on the Chinese automotive uh, economy overall, um, about 14 trillion GDP. And uh, the volume impact so far <laughs> is about 25 million units of vehicle production uh, in the largest market in the world. Uh, China is now the second largest economy behind the United States, uh, a very open market for automotive. Um, and then we see a number of global automakers, including GM, Volkswagen, uh, Nissan, very reliant on uh, China market for sales and contribution to their overall corporate profits. Um, I want to add, too, um, we have had a number of changes in the automotive industry, like consolidation onto a smaller number of platforms, which means we have a greater shared supply chain across those platforms globally. So while they may be making, you know, a C platform vehicle in seven or eight different factories around the world, that supply chain is fairly shared and integrated. So impacts to um, suppliers uh, are going to have you know, a greater multiplier across the, the seven or eight factories making C platform cars for a particular automaker. Um, the biggest threats we see are really disruptions in supply and, and production, um, you know, being curtailed here in North America, and then financial impacts to those automakers and suppliers that are dependent on um, not only China, but other um, major markets for their profits. Um, imports from not only China, but also the rest of the world will be impacted. And then of the Detroit three automakers, we see GM with the greatest exposure. Um, China's shipping to North America is about 30 to 60 days. And like I said, Japan and South Korea is a week to two weeks to clear. Um, so our impacts are being delayed by a month to two months. Um, but also uh, many suppliers and automakers are keeping two or more months of parts inventory for anything sourced from Asia. So we've got this buffer that's protecting us right now that we're drawing down and it's going to start to really uh, bite fairly soon. That timing with the Lunar New Year meant that there was that buildup of production right before, so that kind of delayed this a little bit. Um, and then there is the many levels of the supply chain where there's inventories kept um, even below that. So um, where those inventories are a buffer, but also a delay in any disruptions that we may see. And as you guys all know, we need all the parts to make a car. Uh, we can't do it with, you know, 99.9% .9 of the parts. So those uh, disruptions are going to be, you know, sporadic and ongoing for some time. Um, that inventory and supply tiers may mitigate the disruption or just delay the visibility of the supply chain problems. Uh, with this, I'm going to um, introduce our speakers uh, today. We are very fortunate to have... Um, Michael Dunn. Uh, Mike Dunn is the CEO of a company called Zozo Go. Um, in my mind, Mike is, you know, he's been on the ground uh, in Beijing um, since 1990, 
He's seen a lot, and he certainly has a lot of the automotive industry in his blood. Um, I'm going to let Mike uh, talk about his his company and what he does um, and give you a little bit more perspective on what he is bringing to this conversation in a minute. Um, and then we are also joined by Paul Stepanek. Uh, he's the president of Complete Manufacturing and Distribution. Uh, Paul's also been on the ground in Asia, working in Asia for three decades, um, and he's, you know, got a lot of insights into Asian business strategy, and he works in a number of different industries, not just automotive, so he could have some perspective for what other automakers and what other industries are doing. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I thought my team here was trying to get my attention, sorry. Uh, so I'm gonna kick it off with an opening question. Um, you know, I showed some of the trends overall. We've seen wages rising, increasing trade tensions, changes in the Chinese consumer market for new vehicles, um, a slowing overall growth and lower demand. In particular, the US brands are suffering more than other import brands in the Chinese market, even before the coronavirus outbreak. Um, so can you talk about what changes in the automaker and supplier strategies you, uh, both you, Michael, and Paul have been seeing uh, with regard to the China market prior to January 2020, and what changes in sourcing patterns you've been seeing in recent years? And I'm going to go to Mike first, please. Okay. Thank you, Kristen, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to join this important webinar. It's very timely and very important that uh, we understand exactly what's happening on the ground in China. So with respect to supply chains in China, we can, we can say this for sure. Uh, through the 90s, especially in the 2000s and 2010s, automakers from all over the world understood that China was such an attractive place to build and sell cars, and that's exactly what they did. And we rode a wave of spectacular growth and profits not only did suppliers come in to supply the China market, but they quickly discovered that, hey, we can scale up and concentrate our manufacturing here in China for exports to markets globally. And that's what they did too. Up until, say, for example, uh, President Trump was elected, the administration started to push back on tariffs. And for the first time, suppliers began to understand, oh, we might have overexposure, we might be over concentrated here, in particular, if parts coming to the United States from China are subject to higher tariffs, we should think about plan Bs. Uh, specifically, are there other markets, other industries in Southeast Asia, India, Mexico, where we could also develop um, supply? Uh, now, with the coronavirus, that the urgency around that has just been amplified as, as suppliers find themselves, uh, manufacturers and suppliers find themselves really hostage to the events that are unfolding in China and understanding that without sources outside of China, they're extremely vulnerable. So look for automakers and suppliers to move quickly to develop those plan Bs, that is sourcing outside of China. Uh, that will happen not in a few months, but over the coming years. That's a big new strategic direction for them. And Paul, your your take on what was going on prior to 20, January 2020? Yeah, Kristen, I, I would echo what Michael is saying. Um, and, and broadly speaking, with regards to the China-US relations, there's a decoupling that's happening. And as Mike mentioned, this is the coronavirus is an accelerant. Um, but I think that the, the overall trend that we saw even some years ago was that companies that were manufacturing largely for uh, capturing some of the, um, the uh, cheaper labor uh, costs were shifting from China to Southeast Asia, India, Mexico, et cetera. Um, and companies that uh, were focused on the China market uh, we're keeping some of that production in China for China. Um, we expect that trend to continue. Um, companies that are serious about China for the long term and China will be the largest economy soon and by 2050 it will be a, the largest economy by a factor um, if we believe the 
the the, uh, the math that is put forward by price PwC. Um, so uh, China for China, and then uh, wherever it makes the most sense, uh, those other geographies that we mentioned for exporting to other countries, more developed countries. That's great information. And, you know, both of you guys have, you know, many decades of experience in China. And I think, you know, a lot of us um, who uh, don't have that and folks on the call are wondering, what really does it look like in China right now? And what, um, you know, what does the return uh, back to, um, to reopening look like? And, you know, I think many of us have seen on the news the cloverleaf freeways with no, uh, no cars on them, the, you know, trucks going down the road spraying some kind of disinfectant in the air. Um, but what are your staff and your people in China seeing? And I think we'll go to Mike first. I know you have a couple of slides to show us um, about uh, what your staff is experiencing and what's going on with the automotive industry in China right at this moment. Thank you. Yeah, terrific. Uh, first off, it's important to establish some street cred, and you've already done that for me, Kristen, with folks on who are calling in. Like my co-panelist, Paul, I've lived and worked in China since the early 90s. During those years, I've experienced really a full spectrum of ups and downs from the Asian financial crisis in the 90s to the spectacular rise of China is to become the world's number one producer and consumer of vehicles. But this coronavirus stands as one of the most dramatic developments I've ever witnessed. Um, you know, this invisible creator of social and economic havoc basically has brought a nation of 1.4 billion people to a standstill. Uh, as, as Kristen highlighted, car sales um, fell by 1.6 million units in the last 30 days. And passengers on railways and airplanes, uh, th that rate has dropped by 80% as well. So since the news of the outbreak first surfaced in January, I've been talking and texting with our office in Beijing and clients across China. Today, I'd like to share just a few images that distill the outbreak into the three, what I consider three phases that we understand so far. Uh, this will help us not only understand the situation in China, but also get us ready to prepare for the coming weeks here in the United States. So phase one, I call it stay off the streets. This is a photo of a major intersection in downtown west side of Beijing at 5 p.m. in early February. You see the one motorcyclist delivering, looks like water there, but that's it. And the instructions from the government what, were they closed schools, everyone was instructed to shelter in place, and um, that's what they did. No one moved. It was literally ghost towns, cities of 10 million people, no one on the streets. And that took, um, that was the initial reaction and that lasted for uh, the better part of all of February. So if you can imagine, this is in Beijing, hundreds of miles away from the epicenter of the outbreak. You could see similar images in Shanghai, Guangzhou, up and down the coast across the country. So phase one, stand still, stay off the streets. Then we move to phase two. The next slide, please which um, this is a photo of uh, one of uh, taken by one of our staffers in Beijing when she made her daily visit to the local pharmacy to acquire her quota three masks. Each family was given rights, each individual was given the rights to buy three masks per day, no more. And you can see you'd have to sign in with your ID. He's checking the ID there, uh, cross it against your name, and then you'd be able to buy the masks. Um, that, that I asked them, okay, so what does that feel like in the mornings they go out, buy the mask, get some groceries and go home again. And the words that kept coming back to, uh, kept hearing were boredom, anxiety, boredom, anxiety, and more boredom. They're at home, flipping through the channels, looking at their screens, wondering when this virus would pass and no one had answers. So they just we're at home and following that routine for the better part of all of February. And then if we move into the, probably the current phase, we call it the next slide, please. Um, back to work, or in Chinese, they call it fugong. And um, 
This is a picture my friend took of her TV at home that shows people lining up at an airport in the west of the country. I believe this is Chengdu, where uh, they're getting ready to return to work. Now, we know China has a billion, 400 million people, but pictures like this remind us of just how densely populated the country is. And we're talking about tens of millions of people on the move. And here is where the government stands on this. On the one hand, they want people to get back to work at the economy going again, but no local government wants to be responsible for a fresh outbreak. And as a result, you have a stop start haphazard pell mell here and there hit and miss system set of systems that allow a very gradual reintegration of all these millions of people back to work so you can't say okay next monday we're back to work and we'll be at 100 percent in fact many factories have reopened but they're operating at 20 30 40 maybe 50 percent of their capacity primarily because the people are not back in place yet. Um, next slide, please. Now, cu culture plays a role too, and this is kind of fascinating to me to see this. This is a banner that's been put up in many cities around China. Um, basically, they say, even in the best of times, Chinese leaders are always wary of a kind of chaos or luan, as they call it, lurking just beneath the surface of their society. So during an outbreak like this, you can see slogans that warn people, do not spread rumors. Don't believe rumors. Don't panic, in other words. Um, it occurred to me, maybe we could borrow the slogan for use on Twitter. Uh, from these images, you can see the extent to which supply chains will have been disrupted. If you think about order lead times of six to eight weeks for most suppliers, then we will likely begin to see more and more shortages of parts in the US toward the middle or the end of March. And as much as the supply chain disruption is a major concern, the larger danger, in my opinion, for us here in the United States is demand side collapse. If China is any indication, the people's appetite for going out and buying things, doing things can go to nothing in a hurry. And then how do companies order when both demand and supply are out of kilter? So two things to take away from uh, this, this view of what's happening inside, what has happened inside China. First, we should expect a time of extended uncertainty here in the United States over the next several months and get used to it as soon as we can. And secondly, uh, to the question of diversifying supply chains, there's no doubt in my mind that companies will remain in China to supply the China market, which commands respect because it's the largest market for so many goods and it will remain so. But at the same time, companies will race to diversify the supply chain into promising places like Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, India, Mexico, to diversify the risk and reduce exposure from this type of event in the future. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I know when we were preparing for this call, we were talking about, you know, the, what was going on with the stock market and the machinations and the stocks like Netflix going high because people are going to be nesting, staying in. Um, anything that allowed you to stay in your house might be, a, you know, a, a positive um, and a place to put your money because we're, we're going to be doing a bit of that. Um, I, Paul, you had some great examples. Um, from other work you're doing in other industries about how that's impacting in China. And I'm gonna bring up your slides now and allow you to uh, show us a little bit about what on the ground in China looks like from your perspective. Sure, yeah, thank you, Kristen. <clears throat> um, and again, I would echo what you heard Michael say. And it's interesting when we think about China, we often think about China as this unified monolith where central decisions that get uh, passed down to the uh, provinces and everybody follows in line. And the, the reality is that what we've seen is, first of all, at the top, there's not unity where you have Xi pushing hard for continuing with the quarantine and Li, Premier Li, pushing in a different direction with wanting to get the economy restarted and people back into into jobs and, and worried about uh, companies going out of business. And so I, I think what we've seen and what has been interesting, and, and this first slide is 
uh, and and we'll come back to this, but the first slide is, uh, wow, you know, this is the first time that we've seen the overhead road uh, fill up again in Shanghai. And this is our HR manager going back to work, and she was kind of laughing on her message saying, "I'm going to be late. I didn't expect anybody else to be out there." Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, and the things that we've been seeing um, as things are are returning to normal are uh, a very large discrepancy between different areas that are not very far apart. So Suzhou, which is just about an hour away from Shanghai, uh, we have uh, experienced an industrial zone that is actually fining factory owners per person uh, based on the number of people that they have working at the factory if there is one person found that is uh, sick with the virus. And so if the factory owner has a, you know 300 people, they get fined 5,000 uh, renminbi per person, $700 per person. It's a pretty big fine. And then you have just uh, another hour and a half away uh, in Hangzhou, and, and this is the, the home to Alibaba and uh, quite a number of small and mid-sized companies, they're actually um, providing people with free train tickets. Please come back and work. And um, we've also ha heard reports where they're chartering airplanes and sending them to distant provinces to collect workers to come back. And they're also offering 500 to 1,000 roaming B uh, uh, for incidental expenses related to getting back to work uh, in Zhejiang province. And so two areas that are very close together are are experiencing very different stories. In fact, last week we had a group of of, uh, of our people out at, at, at factory doing third party quality control, um, and it was three people and, and they went out and, and they had to go through 12 different checkpoints on a two hour drive um, to get through and at each checkpoint their temperatures were taken and at some of the checkpoints their ID cards were recorded um, they had a full day at the factory, nine o'clock at night there at the hotel, and uh, our operations manager was the driver for the day because our drivers weren't comfortable during the driving, so he, he decided to drive. And um, he was told, look, I, you know, we know it's three of you, we know that you came in from Shanghai, um, and you now have to go back to Shanghai, you will not be permitted to stay here. And it was after we had pre-cleared that those guys would be allowed to go out. Um, and the government basically turned on a dime and said, uh, you, you can't you can't come to the factory tomorrow and you cannot stay here tonight. And so they had to hop in the car and, and drive back to Shanghai. Now that was uh, last week. And what we're seeing this week is more what you'd see uh, represented in this slide where Starbucks is serving coffee. Um, People can go to the cinemas, but they have to have a row and a seat between uh, everybody that goes to the cinema. Um, and so it, it's it's pragmatic, um, but people are getting back to making things happen. Uh, we work with uh, brand owners on making and distributing products. So we've got product going both ways from China to uh, rest of world and rest of world into China. Um, we work with hundreds of factories uh, and to date, uh, we only had one factory uh, that was not able to uh, ship and not able to produce. Uh, but as of uh, a few days ago, that factory has also been able to move into production. Um, production volumes that we were seeing at, um, let's say in February, we achieved 70% of what we were anticipating, what we had for originally forecasted uh, as far as exports. Um, and uh, in March, we're anticipating that number actually to be closer to 100, maybe to 120% of what we forecasted, making up some of the ground that had been lost in January and February. Now, uh, Kristen, you had mentioned kind of one of the interesting stories. We bring in uh, high-end uh, exercise equipment that's used at the sports institutes or gym facilities, as well as uh, some home. Um, and this is one of those products that you scratch your head and you say, wow, okay, so we're seeing an increased demand. And then you think about it, it's like, well, actually this makes a lot of sense. People don't wanna go into gyms. Uh, they wanna buy the equipment and use it at home rather than being exposed to a group of people that are sweating on the equipment. Um, and as you look at 
the you know dig into the data it's gone from gym purchases heavily into online purchases by individuals and volume has increased i think it's by, by about 40 percent uh what we'd expect for this time of year so we've seen a a, a market increase uh in in that kind of fun interesting story there back to you Kristen. great thank you um, I want to remind our audience that if you have questions for our uh, panelists, uh, you can send them to us through your chat function in the webinar. Um, we're looking forward to getting your questions answered in addition to ones that, that I have for these guys. Um, you know, we talked a little bit in your slide presentation about people are returning to work and things are just restarting. Um, what do you think about uh, when does China get fully back online? Um, and is it going to be possible to make up for these weeks of lost production? Um, and, you know, is it possible for, you know, even if uh, Hubei remains uh, shut longer, can the rest of China make up for it? Or are there specific things that are made in Hubei that the rest of China is not going to be able to make up? Right. Uh, you know, with regards to uh, Hubei, we go back to keep in mind that there are probably six, eight Detroits of China. Um, Hubei is one of them, but you also have Shanghai, Guangzhou, um, Changchun, et cetera, Beijing. And uh, those, most of what's exported in terms of parts to the United States from China come from the Yangtze River Delta, that's greater Shanghai area, or from Guangdong um, near Hong Kong. And those factories are in relatively much better shape up, of course, than, than Hubei and Wuhan. So with regards to su supply to the United States, that's a plus. That's, a, that's looking good uh, for the future. At the same time, you know, you mentioned shipping to the United States maybe eight weeks. Well, keep in mind, they were not producing for a month. There's a gap there, and it can be made up, but inevitably there's a gap of about a month that um, unless you air freight, you simply cannot catch up with in the short term. So I anticipate we'll feel a crunch later this month, but then the Chinese um, manufacturers will be back to quote unquote normal by late April. And from there, we should be in much better shape. Look for a, an interim bump and then um, a smoother, smoother road once we get into late April. Well, and I mentioned that we've seen some uh, reliance on premium freight uh, already. Um, mm -hmm. How are the automakers and suppliers going to get their parts and components once the production restarts? Do you think um, there's a uh, continue the premium freight while they're putting things on the water at the same time so that we can you know, have have some things back on the normal channels, um, mm -hmm. or how how much more reliance on premium freight and therefore higher costs is the industry going to bear? I, I think that's that's still happening as we speak, and we don't know how much more. I have heard in the industry that um, Ford and GM and probably FCA have. Um, rented cargo planes um, with tens of millions of dollars of, of equipment, or sorry, uh, of parts aboard, uh, not only for the United States, but for also for Argentina and Brazil. So we're right in the thick of things. And if you recall, just I think you mentioned just the other day, Mary Barra said, we're good until late, deep into March. What she didn't say was what happens deep into March. Um, that's probably still being resolved as we speak. Do they need to air freight more or they can, can they get enough on the water? And that in turn depends on what demand looks like in the United States. So uh, really up in the air. Really and is there the any air. way um, to talk about what, I mean, once things get back on the water, I mean, the ports are pretty desolate right now. Um, yes. At least the West Coast ports are. Um, and then we'll have a big armada of cargo ships heading toward the west coast of the United States. 
how do they get priority in? And you know, just is the automaker are the automakers and suppliers going to be facing higher costs to prioritize their cargo uh, through the through the checkpoints at the ports? It seems there's no way to escape those higher costs in the short term. There's got to be some pain associated with this disruption, and that's exactly the places where it'll come up first. It's we're really in uncharted waters. We haven't seen this kind of widespread in the past. It's been a factory that had a fire or a tsunami and wiped out a city or a industrial area. But this is a broad brush across the country, second largest economy in the world, blanketed with this freeze on production. We've never seen anything like this before. And how does it get back to normal? Well, and for the rest of the world now, too, as it spreads across Europe and, and other areas that produce vehicles and parts. I think you know, the one maybe positive side of this um, versus, say, the tsunami in 2011 um, is that their factories were wiped off the face of the earth. Um, mm -hmm. And now we have factories and people, and we just need to get them back together um, and get the, you know, the pump primed again and, and get this working again. And I think... You mentioned earlier, you know, the real crisis could be a demand crisis, um, mm -hmm. and in addition to this disruption in production. Um, you know, after SARS, we saw there was an uptick in personal vehicle demand in China. You know, more of that, like the home exercise equipment uh, anecdote that, you know, people wanted to stay off public transit and if they could afford or they were on the tipping point about whether to buy a car or not, they're like, we're going to have our own vehicle so that we're not exposed to those random viruses that are out there in the world. Do you see any of that same kind of thing that could happen in um, a post-coronavirus world? And is there any upside to North American firms if, if that happens? I think uh, there's, there's a couple of opposing forces in play here. Definitely agree uh, that, that more people will be mindful of the benefits of having their own car. You know, China is the biggest ride hailing market in the world. DD serves it, but people will think twice about getting into DD now and would pr prefer to have their own car. At the same time, we are not economically at the same juncture as we were post SARS. What, what do I mean by that? The economy in China has, has been fairly weak um, for a while now. Car sales are down two years in a row. They'll be down again this year. So as much as consumers would like to have their own car, do they have the wherewithal, the financing to make that happen? Uh, I'm not so sure this time. I, I don't see them rebounding from this and going out and buying a ton of cars. I, I think they're still more concerned about overall economic strength of the economy, their jobs and their security. And they're probably going to be holding on to money um, more so than going out and spending it like they did in the 2000s. Kristen, if I could just chime in on that topic as well as some of the others that, that have been covered in, in the last couple of minutes. Um, so what we're seeing with regards to expediting shipments, and this is across a pretty broad bunch of different types of uh, uh, industries that we're working with, um, we're looking at uh, potential air uh, freight for about 6% of the goods that we'd be moving in uh, March timeframe. And again, this goes back to, is demand going to soften enough that we don't have to put those things onto planes and we can just go back to the traditional um, uh, uh, tr traditional way of shipping, which is by by land, by sea. By sea. Um, uh, so that's that's one comment or one one bit of data that I could share. Um, another one is that what we're anticipating is as the virus kicks off in some other countries that are uh, maybe more or less less able to control it in the way that China has been able to do it with extraordinary measures uh, involving big data, et cetera, um, and a large degree of government control. Um, that the World Health Organization, and, and this is not my opinion, this is the opinion of people that have been studying viruses and, and uh, uh, Harvard uh, uh, professors, uh, and, and they believe that there will be a shift in what the World Health Organization 
will advise, and it'll be going from uh, containment or quarantine and shifting into a mindset of 80% uh, of the world's going to get this, and we just have to concentrate our efforts on a vaccine. And all, all, albeit a vaccine is not imminent, it's it's months or or you know a year or more away. Um, that we may all shift our mindset around how. Um, it's dealt with and that just being more broadly uh, talking about the disruption that we have globally i think that we're on the front end of when we were talking just before we went live uh, of uh, universities and businesses um, telling their staff to work from home and figuring out how to do that efficiently is going to take a while uh, and as everybody leans back on their heels and and delays p purchasing decisions uh, the global economy is going to take a hit, and I think that we have to be prepared that it it's going to take a while to get the flywheel spinning again. And so we're going back to the uh, logistics issue again. We're not anticipating that there is going to be a lineup of ships on the west coast of the U.S. trying to get into port. Um, I could be completely wrong on that, and uh, but at, the, at this point we see it's it, we're going to we're going to ease back into it. Um, sort of in incrementally over the coming months with soft demand. One of the questions, and you know, the Automotive News had a um, opinion piece yesterday from uh, Automotive News China uh, that quest brought into question whether China had enough resources to both combat the virus and stimulate its economy and whether auto sales stimulation would be one of the priorities they have. Um, what do you see, you know, when we're uh, in China, at least um, in a post, their, you know, their daily case reports are are declining now. Um, what does the Chinese government do? I mean, they're they've, they're spending a lot of money on this lockdown and and combating the virus. Do they put out a, an economic stimulus, um, and do they have a specific stimulus to try to drive auto sales back up? You know, we've seen already in southern China, in Guangzhou and Shenzhen, uh, some illustrations of the ways in which the Chinese government could subsidize or ignite or be a catalyst for sales. And that is through rebates or uh, direct subsidies of several hundred dollars on a car. But that has not been, as not a national directive, and it hasn't been widespread, at least up until now. Uh, the feeling is that at the central level, they've been wanting to have consolidation of the industry for so long. And um, when companies face some adversity as they do now, maybe it's not the best way for governments to spend their money is to, to uh, try to inflate sales again. So I don't see China having putting cars above other industries and above health um, in, the, in their budgets. So I don't expect major stimulus for the auto industry, maybe here and there, as we've seen in Shenzhen and Guangzhou, but not a national initiative, no. What we're seeing, and, sorry, Kristen, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna um, shift a little bit. Um, one of the things that we talked about early on uh, was uh, the impact of tooling. Um, there's a lot of tool builds that have been um, in China, I know that many of the tooling companies we know uh, pulled back out of China and uh, were, you know, bringing partially built tools out of China uh, to uh, South Korea and Taiwan and other countries um, in advance of the tariff uh, that went into place last fall on tooling. Um, what do you see might be the impact for product launches here, uh, specifically the impact of uh, if tooling hasn't been worked on for a month or more in China, um, are we going to see launch delays in North America? The 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 people who run the supplier, uh, every automaker and many of the first tiers have special teams, and they're being extraordinarily silent on the question. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> So it leads us to conclude that there is genuine concern of disruption. We haven't seen it yet. Uh, we probably would, if we're going to see one, it'll be later in March. But information is so tight on that front right now. Um, 
there must be something cooking, but we, I don't have firsthand knowledge of what that means. Right. Well, I think, you know, this may be a case where the tariffs were um, somewhat impactful in, in uh, you know, getting Chinese built, Chinese built tools out uh, before the coronavirus crisis happened. I mean, I know that many of the tooling suppliers did move builds um, even to Eastern Europe. Um, not that those other countries aren't also going to be impacted by coronavirus, um, but there was a, you know, a mass exodus um, from tooling companies that we interact with um, to try to get out in advance of the, the additional to tariff on tools. Um, so that might be a good thing here. Um, you know, I want to get to, you know, we're wrapping up here at the end. Um, you know, after the 2011 tsunami and earthquake, automakers and suppliers really dug much deeper into their supply chains, uh, trying to get better transparency into their sub first tier suppliers. Um, how do you think this outbreak is likely to change uh, the auto industry and automotive supply chains once the coronavirus is under control? Um, you know, and what does the future automotive landscape look like with regard to China? Um, and, you know, a year from now, when we're past all of this and maybe we have seen, um, what are going to be the lessons learned? Paul, shall I go first on that one? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking when I first arrived in Asia in the 90s, uh, the darling of foreign direct investment in the auto industry was Southeast Asia, uh, particularly Thailand, where you could own and operate 100% of your business and the economy was thriving. China was seen as a black hole at that time, a scary black hole where you put money in and it never came out. And then the pendulum swung again in the 2000, 2010s, and all the money seemed to flow into China no one was thinking anymore. Everyone was just, you know, understandably chasing the growth. And um, I sense that we're at another pendulum swing where it won't swing back to Southeast Asia or India necessarily entirely, uh, but instead it'll find a nice balance where companies will remain in China to serve the China market, but they will rightly, the smarter ones will rightly say, hey, these markets aren't as big as China, but they're promising, they're growing. There's a population of 450 million in Southeast Asia, more than a billion in India. Why don't we begin to explore not only um, market development in those, in those countries, but also begin to build and um, return to the 90s and think of strategically of making our supply chains strong in those regions too. So sort of a balanced pendulum, one way Southeast Asia, pendulum swinging to China, now coming back to the middle where you have diversification. That's my view of where we're going next. I, I would, my comments would be similar. Um, China is not gonna be exiting manufacturing. All they're doing is moving up the value chain. Um, it's a massive market. Uh, companies that uh, are in it for the, lo the long term are, are focusing their efforts on in China for China. Um, possibly in China for rest of world, depending on uh, what tariff situations, but you can be doing rest of world X and excluding North America. Um, but we've also seen uh, companies that are forward looking, making big bets on, okay, we're gonna do the China for China, but we also want a mirror image of what we have in China, in name your Southeast Asian country, in Malaysia, um, and we want to be up and running uh, by the end of uh, you know, 2021. Uh, and so they're already making those, those investments. Uh, once those investments are in place, we don't see people that have largely uh, diversified the supply chain moving back into China if the tariffs somehow go away, um, but they would be free to toggle between China and Southeast Asia uh, depending on where they're getting the, the, the most value for uh, their effort. And we're going to, uh, with that, make this a wrap on this uh, webinar on the coronavirus update. I do want to say that if you're interested in what's happening with tariffs um, and trade and all the various and sundry 
uh, bilateral and multilateral deals the U.S. is currently uh, contemplating. We are going to dig into those topics on Tuesday in our webinar with uh, Chad Bown. If you are an ACP member or a CAR affiliate uh, program member, you will be welcome to join into that call 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning and get in touch with us um, if you want to register for that. Um, there was a question about whether uh, CAR uh, would be willing to compile information on OEM announcements, supplier announcements, shutdowns, um, and you know just keeping tr keeping track of all of the announcements that are coming. As you know, many automakers and suppliers are just trying to wrap their arms around all of that. Um, we will consider that, and we'll get back out to the affiliates and ACP members if that's something that we decide to take on here at CAR. Um, and it's a very good suggestion, and we thank you very very much for that. So with that, I want to thank uh, Michael Dunn, the CEO of ZozoGo. Uh, Paul Stepanek from Complete Manufacturing and Distribution, uh, and all of you for calling in and joining us for the webinar today on the coronavirus update. Thank you so very much. We appreciate your membership. Thank you.